Hi, I'm Doug McGinnis. My family has been keeping bees and packing honey in Florida for the last 77 years. Just lately, everyone's asking me, what's happening to the bees? It's a complicated situation. To start to understand, we need to go back a long time to when flowers taught bees to be vegetarians. The partnership between mankind and honeybees goes back to the dawn of man when hunters discovered that knocking down bee nests and putting up with the stings yielded the sweet golden reward of honey. That led to knocking the swarms into baskets and logs, and early humans discovered there was much more than just honey to be gained from the hive. Records dating 9,000 years ago shows how beeswax became the solution to waterproofing and sealing cracks in boats and buildings. Beekeeping was a necessary trade in early com communities. Just what is beeswax? Beeswax is bee fat. Bees just overeat and excrete the excess calories in wax scales, which other bees then will chew into honeycombs. I've always thought, wouldn't it be great if we could just overeat to build our own homes? Now let's go way back before humans were on the scene harvesting honey and beeswax. I'm talking about 200 million years. That's when flowering plants arose. The bees at that time were more like wasps. Bees need a protein source to feed their larvae for growth and development. These early bees were capturing other insects, just like wasps, paralyzing them with stings and feeding their young the meat. Around that time, flowers were developing. Naturally, they couldn't move. To increase their diversity, they needed a way to spread their reproductive means, their pollen, from one flower to another. So flowers developed and evolved scents and patterns that were actually runways to lure bees and other insects to their pollen and spread it around. Pollen contains a rich bounty of proteins and amino acids. It was the super powerful protein source of pollen that lured bees away from eating insects. On this slide, the honeybee has collected pollen on the hairs on her body and has chewed it into little balls to store in pouches on her legs. If you looked at these hairs under a microscope, you would see that they look like the most perfect combs in the world. Being covered in pollen, she'll then visit other flowers and the pollen will initiate reproduction that will produce seeds, creating the flowers and vegetables and trees that thrive on this planet today. So you see, honey is not the most va valuable thing we get from honeybees. It did become the first sweetener of mankind, and also when it fermented, it became mankind's first alcoholic beverage but it was the honeybee's ability to pollinate crops that made it the workhorse of modern agriculture. In the 1830s, a man named Langstroth turned his observation of the bee space between honeycombs in the wild into a functioning hive box in which honey could be collected without destroying the hives. And then the hives could be transported from place to place and from one nectar source to another and one crop could be pollinated and then another. Uh, in the 1830s, a man named Dr. Langstroth observed the bee space, that is the space between combs out in the wild. By developing frames that had this same bee space, the bees would collect honey in the combs and not gum them together with wax. That way, the hive could be transported, taken apart, the honey could be extracted, and the frames put back in. The bees would develop and, and, and uh, fill the frames up with honey again, a completely reusable system that would make the beekeeping of modern agriculture. Some say this was the beginning of the end for the bees because at this point, they became a sort of semi-domesticated animal. Um, and uh, no longer did we have to uh, go and try to find swarms. Since the hives could be transported from one place to another, from one nectar source to another,
and, for one, and one crop to be pollinated to another. Uh, modern beekeeping began and pollination services increased the agriculture around the country and the world. Today, pollination is the most important source of income for commercial beekeepers in the USA. In 2009, commercial beekeepers in the USA made $140 million from honey sales and $145 million from almond pollination alone. Almonds, like some other fruits and vegetables, are completely pollinator dependent. It takes eight bees to pollinate an almond blossom to create one almond that you eat. Right now, in fact, as we're speaking in February, hundreds of thousands of hives are headed to California's Central Valley, where 80 to 90 percent of the world's almonds are produced. The beehives are loaded onto semi-flatbeds, distributed through the orchards, and along with them they are mixed with hives from throughout the USA and even as far away as Australia. The bees come back home, but they've been exposed to diseases from other bees. They've been exposed to pesticides, fungicides, and they come back home fairly stressed and sick. This is one of the keys to what's happening to the bees today. You know, I love my vegan friends, and some of them won't eat honey because they think it's exploiting the bees. But I remind them to consider all the almond milk they're drinking and the almonds that they are eating. And it's not just almonds. Blueberries, stone fruits, watermelons, even alfalfa and clover used for hay for dairy animals all require insect pollination. And honeybees are the most commercialized and the easiest insect of choice to use for pollination work. Beekeepers take hives around the country pollinating crop after crop, plus bringing in honey whenever they can get away with that too. So um, the life of a beekeeper is migratory. You're always moving your bees. You're always moving them from one place to another. And in fact, here in Florida, they come back and forth depending on the weather and depending on what's blooming. Our desire for abundance and the demands of mega agriculture have put an unbelievable stress on honeybees. We need more and more, faster and faster, and the honeybees are dwindling because of the stress. Just a few years ago, a large commercial beekeeper would have a thousand hives. Today, it takes at least 20,000 hives to sustain a beekeeper's operation and make a living if he's in the business of commercial beekeeping and pollination. Beekeepers plan on losing 30% or more of their hives every season. They must be replaced with more hives, creating a booming industry in the queen bee production, that's the mother of the hive, and also in nucleus starter hives. Think of the hives as a superorganism, each bee working in tandem, making decisions, and communicating like neurons in a giant brain. At the center of it all is the queen bee, there can be only one queen per hive, and all the workers in the, and drones in the hive are her progeny. She is laying up to 2,000 eggs per day every day for up to four years. Yet because of the imperatives of pollination, beekeepers are replacing queen bees often two times a year to produce more young earlier and earlier. The growing problems of sustaining our honeybee population has led to the study of other insects to do the pollination work, um, such as alfalfa le leaf cutter bees and some bumblebees. Now, these are already being commercially produced, yet there are many species that are able to pollinate crops. These beautiful weird bees come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. They differ from honeybees in that rather than forming superorganisms of 60 to 100,000 individuals all working together as one, these bees often live solitary lives or form very small social groups. You know, so many people want to become beekeepers today, and I love it, and it's so wonderful that everyone's interested in, in, in bees as a hobby. But I can tell you, it's not as easy as it used to be. It's rewarding and fascinating, 
but sometimes hard and disappointing to keep honeybees thriving. Luckily, in many cities and counties across the USA, there are beekeeping clubs, and joining them is well worth it. For just learning from people that have done it before, from sharing equipment, from sharing problems, and you get to become part of a unique community. Still, everyone should not be a beekeeper. Municipalities and homeowners associations might prohibit keeping bees, but it's also a hobby that requires time and money. A much easier route is to become a native beekeeper. Making crafty little bee hotels with pipe and bamboo is an easy and fun craft for the entire family. Hanging them in the garden will attract pollinators of many types. A link to UF Native Buzz at the end of this presentation will offer some hints to make a gar your garden pollinator friendly. Many native pollinators are ground dwellers. Limiting the amount of land that you actually cultivate and till will allow these little ground dwellers to thrive, and especially the lower areas of your yard. Enjoy mud puddles and help your native bees. And let's talk about wasps. These are honeybees' carnivorous cousins. But wasps also play an important part in nature and our gardens by actually eating bad bugs. They lay their eggs directly on caterpillars to provide tasty meals for their young and in this way kill the, the caterpillars that are munching our tomatoes and other crops. Specialized wasps are being bred commercially just to target many harmful agricultural pests. Now what else can you do? I'll admit, I'm paraphrasing the great bee scientist Marla Spivak from the University of Minnesota Bee Lab, who, who has a wonderful bee TED talk that you should find and listen to. So, my three hints. First of all, reduce or eliminate your use of pesticides. There are so many non-chemical ways you can fight bad bugs in your garden. And if you do have to use pesticides, do so when the bees are not flying in the evening or at night or early, early in the morning and follow directions carefully on the label. The label is the law and it will, it will help save many, many different bees in your yard. Number two, buy local and in season. Put up your own stance against the energy uh, consuming mega agriculture we've created today. Um, try to be seasonal about the way you buy things and uh, it may not be necessary to have such an abundance on our table all the time. I know that's a ha bad habit uh, that we get in and a hard one to uh, combat. This is the most important. Plant wildflowers and feed the bees. Planting a small patch of local wildflowers where your lawn just won't grow at all it not only creates beauty and attracts bees and butterflies, but it eliminates mowing, fertilizing, and pesticides. Did you know that a four by eight wildflower patch in your yard can increase the pollinators in your entire neighborhood? It's so easy, and the spring is a great time to get started. You can even plant wildflowers in, a, in patio containers and, and bring beautiful bees and butterflies to your balcony. Find out from your local extension agency uh, just what grows in your, in your area, but planting wildflowers will feed the bees. Finally, and the real reason I'm here today is to ask for your support in building a new honeybee and pollinator lab at the University of Florida. Hundreds of thousands of commercial beekeepers and, uh, move their honey bee hives in and out of Florida every year. We have long been home to some of the world's most renowned apiculture scientists, but we now need an up-to-date bee lab to support their work. After three years, the state of Florida has released some funding for the basic lab. Our goal is to include the first teaching facility for commercial beekeeping and native pollinator research. Some of the areas we're working on now, including testing pesticides, often labeled bee-friendly, to see if they are safe for bee larvae as well. We're also looking at eliminating bee pests more effectively, such as the small hive beetle. 
Teaching best practices for beekeepers for honey production is another area of interest. Improving managed honeybee health by conducting research projects focused on honeybee husbandry, including honeybee colony disease and pest management, nutrition and toxicology, understanding wild honeybee ecology, promoting integrated crop pollination. All of these things are coming together at the University of Florida Bee Lab. We need your help to make our teaching facility a reality. Our brochure lists ways you can uh, create a legacy of helping bees through naming opportunities and honorary square foot purchases. So we hope you will become a lasting contributor to our UFB lab. The good that has come out of the crisis of honeybee decline is that more and more people are aware of the special relationship we have with this tiny life-giving insect. We are striving at the University of Florida Bee Lab to be part of a many-layered solution. Please help us achieve that goal. Please help us help. Boo, 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 boo. Okay. Let me just, okay.